My pleasure today is to introduce you to Brendan Haley, Senior Director of Policy at Efficiency Canada, and Kevin Lockhart, former Director of Buildings Policy at Efficiency Canada. And they are going to present some of our recent, some of Kevin's recent work and, and Brendan's recent work on uh, policies and technologies uh, to advance innovation in new housing construction. I might have flubbed the title a little bit, but you know what? They will correct me when I pass it over to Brendan right now. So Brendan, feel free to go ahead. Great. And Kevin's got the screen sharing going up. Hey, everyone. So I'm going to start off with just a few intro comments. The bulk of this work, the bulk of the words and pages in the report was done by by Kevin, who I will you know then hand it off to. So let's just go to the next slide, Kevin. So the outline of this presentation, it's pretty simple. We're going to talk about the problem, a problem of Canada needing to build more homes, but also build those homes to a high environmental performance. And we're going to talk about how they're really the same problem, we think, related to the need for, for different innovations in the construction sector. Then I'm going to hand it over to Kevin to talk about promising technologies and practices, and then concluding with some thoughts on policy. So very quickly, just the next slide, let's get into what the problem is. Next slide, Kevin. So we all know that Canada needs to build more homes. Um, this is a major policy preoccupation right now. Um, we also need to get those homes to be net zero homes. And of course, every home that fails to be built to that net zero standard, you know, moves us away from that goal and presents a missed opportunity. And these two policy challenges, you know, they can be seen at odds with each other. But I think if you look at the dynamics within the construction sector, actually they're confronted by a very similar problem about the need to build both fast and green. And, and that problem is, you know, a construction sector that really needs to meet either challenge to be much more productive. It needs to adopt new technologies. It needs to transition over to different types of production systems. So the question is really, how do we trigger innovation and change in the construction sector? And how do we do that to build more homes and better homes? So next slide, Kevin. So with that line of thinking about the problem, the report actually starts, this is my small contribution with some general lessons from historical patterns of innovation in, in all sectors before looking at you know, the construction sector in particular. So one general lesson is that a single technology, it often only achieves you know, its real performance when it is combined with a bunch of other technologies and then changes in regulatory systems. So you can think about like the electric light. Well, what go is behind the electric light is a whole system of transmission, metering technology, et cetera, right? So, you know, Kevin in the report provides examples of say mass timber biogenic materials, how they also are combined with, you know, greater use of in-factory construction of digital technologies to customize designs. So that's really an example of the importance of multiple different technologies working together in combination to achieve, you know, high performance. Um, another common innovation pattern is that technological development, it, it narrows into pathways and paradigms, we call them sometimes. And that's a good thing because that improves productivity. It, it mean, but it can also mean that technology systems, they can get stuck, right? There can be better solutions out there, but people are relatively close to them because they don't fit with the given way of say doing things or the problems people are trying to solve. And a key part of you know, shifting technologies is, is finding value in new areas where you might not have looked before, right? So to give a long ago historical example of that, if you think about the transition from early water power to steam power, right? Like steam was not cost competitive compared to water at first. The primary benefit of steam was that it was more dependable because you could load and you could locate those factories anywhere, not by, you know, water where water wheels were. They were therefore less vulnerable to like weather fluctuations. 
It provided more regular power. So if you were doing cloth weaving, you got more uniform cloth, higher quality cloth. So that's a long ago example. But, you know, that story seems quite similar to me of, say, like modular construction, where the real value is in terms of right now is in terms of high quality air sealing, less vulnerability to weather issues on site, things like improved safety, right? Another area is during paradigm shifts, you know, things get shaken up. People start to say, search more broadly for new solutions, but those windows can again close very quickly. And that's interesting today. And when we think about scaling up housing supply, say to do that, say we need a paradigm shift. So that introduces a time bound opportunity to bake in high energy and greenhouse gas performance in construction practices. And so I think we're at a point where there is that potential right now, there's that potential to make hitting net zero performance, you know, much easier, but that certainly isn't inevitable. So, you know, for instance, the report talks about digital technologies, you can more efficiently source local materials, more efficiently source high environmental quality materials um, using digital technologies, but whether or not they're actually used in that way is really not inevitable. It's about providing the right direction. So that brings me to the final point, which is that direction of innovation matters, which means goals matter. And the sort of spoiler alert is that the report makes the argument that policies like net zero emission building codes are important because they point construction innovation in the right direction, right? Thus, those policies facilitate, you know, the paradigm shift we need to achieve for both positive affordability and climate outcomes. So if we can understand the problem and solutions, I think appropriately, we can see that there's an opportunity to both build more homes and to meet our environmental goals. So I'm gonna now hand it over to Kevin, who's gonna get into the specifics and discuss talk about some of these technological opportunities. Great. Thank you very much, Brennan. And I, I think you're being too modest with your contributions. It was, yeah, it was a, a great, great exercise to, to work together and very, very happy with the outcomes. Um, so just a little bit of background on the report. Uh, the re report was conceived of in the summer of 2023. Um, that summer, we could see a clear lack of housing options. Uh, rising costs in, in the construction sector and other headwinds, uh, which also included things like constrained labor. Um, and that summer also saw a uh, significant increase in the impacts of, of climate driven extreme weather. So these are all challenges facing the existing construction paradigm. And, and the question that was really driving the research was how can Canada build more homes uh, faster than ever while also achieving higher environmental outcomes? What we found was there's a unique opportunity to, 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 sorry, to develop and implement a coordinated and multi-pronged policy approach. And that, that approach also is complete with long-term targets. In doing so, that would enable four key innovation areas to con that, that complement each other uh, to really um, uh, take up market penetration. These are, uh, as Brendan mentioned, the increased use of pre-manufactured pre uh, building components, the increased use of biogenic materials, uh, adopting and utilizing uh, a, a range of digital tools and exploring new avenues for delivering uh, thermal energy and electrification. These aren't necessarily new technologies, but it's their interactions and their the combinations of these technologies and their eventual success depends on minimizing risk uh, involved in bringing them to market under a supportive policy framework. And so with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at uh, offsite construction as a first innovation. So pre-assembly or offsite construction can include uh, sub-assembly modules, uh, volumetri volumetric uh, units, as well as panelization. It can help overcome labor shortages and, and declining productivity, which we've seen in the, the construction sector, and can be scaled up to help meet our ambitious housing requirements. In, uh, at the same time, it can help increase the energy and emissions performance of new construction, as well as the resilience uh, of newly constructed residential buildings. Um, now, premium manufactured components have been with, with us for uh, close to 100 years since the, the advent of the Sears Craftsman home kits, which were dropped off by rail across Canada. Um, however, there's more potential than ever to leverage prefabricated pre solutions uh, that can be constructed off-site and delivered for assembly. 
Um, one of the key benefits that uh, prefabricated solutions bring is increased productivity and shortened construction schedules, both of which can help save money on the, in the construction process, uh, lowering, lowering uh, prices and in increasing affordability. Um, but they also bring opportunities to optimize energy and emissions performance. And, and that really comes in the design, design phase um, where most of the uh, impactful energy efficiency or emissions measures are, are, are present. It can also help capture structural efficiencies and reduce waste in that process. On-site, pre-assembly leads to fewer material deliveries, which is an important consideration when looking at the safety of the site. It can help minimize the risk and also minimize disruptions in the local community, which is an important consideration if we, if we are seeking to scale up construction. And, and that's quite significant if we look back on some of Efficiency Canada's work with the Housing and Climate Task Force. A factory setting can also have other advantages in terms of the, the, the pool of available, available labor. So it can extend careers of those already in the sector, helping really from that indoor environment, making it more attractive to, to continue working or, or to deal with, for example, mobility, mobility challenges that might happen later in, in tradespeople's careers. And it can also help attract new participants, uh, largely because it's off, offering a stable, uh, safe work environment uh, out of the elements. And so by bringing the, the entire construction process uh, into the factory setting, we see higher standards of performance, um, better code compliance as, as pre-compliance pre can be achieved uh, within that, that factory setting. And then also through the optimization of, of design and building materials we, and, and, and that oversight that can be um, achieved within the, the factory, we can see enhanced quality control. There's also benefits in terms of the repeat, repeatability of assemblies and modules in that factory setting. So offsite construction helps with helps reduce the, 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 the volume of resources needed for new construction, which inherently uh, reduces the embodied emissions up front, helps to limit the waste from the construction process itself. And so wasted materials uh, also represent embodied emissions. And then we also have advantages in terms of better performing buildings uh, during their operation. Next up, we have biogenic materials, and, and we grouped within this bucket uh, mass timber and wood structures, which are increasingly increasingly considered an alternative to concrete or steel as structural or, or, or load-bearing uh, components. But we also considered uh, carbon sequest sequestering biomass materials, um, for example, straw, hemp, wood, bamboo, cork, and wool. And uh, these have the advantage of acting as a carbon sink as well and being rapidly renewable. Uh, so these uh, can be used as structural components, such as beams and studs, uh, columns or decking, and uh, wall panels. Um, now, much like pre-assembled components, they take advantage of, of um, uh, prefabrication um, off-site, and in doing so can help speed construction, and largely that's due to uh, inherent scheduling logistical advantages that we outline uh, in the report. Again, fewer deliveries of materials and uh, fewer lab labor resources and reduced waste all create advantages in, in terms of environmental benefits. But there's also benefits in terms of applying this, uh, these materials combined with the, the innovation of greater pre-assembly, which makes them ideal for, for the complexity of, of urban development, which we expect to see more of going forward rather than uh, the greenfield, greenfield development of the past. And again, like offsite construction, optimi optimization plays a big role in supporting biogenic materials as they rely heavily on digital tools. This helps optimize material use, streamline the construction process, and also helps with the sequencing and delivering of materials and their installation. All of which leads to better outcomes in terms of speed of construction, cost, energy use, emissions, and safety. There's also benefits, of course, with biogenic materials towards a greater, greater circularity or the circular economy. As a lower life cycle impact of those materials is one benefit, but they can also act as material banks to be reused or repurposed in the future. Now, in the next uh, innovation uh, bucket, we also have alternatives to fossil fuel heating systems. And so this is common, more common items like heat pumps but also heat recovery as thermal energy, say from sewage resources or from deep water cooling and district energy. Stretching this bucket a little bit, we also included electrification with a, a focus on demand response. This gives off buildings the opportunity to, when complemented with alternative sources of, of heating and cooling, to be more fuel flexible, to enable fuel switching at scale, 
and to centralize emissions, emission controls in a way that uh, individual heating systems can't. So obviously heating and hot water systems play a significant role in the emissions of a building with uh, accounting for uh, about 80% of all uh, residential energy use and, and the emissions associated with that. And it's really the combinations of, of these, these, these technologies or innovations. And uh, they provide a good example of how different innovations, the impact can be amplified versus when they stand alone. So thermal energy is an ideal complement to electrification. And this is because each connection lessens the potential burden to the electric, electric, electricity system and also in greater, in, in, enables greater flexibility. With electrification in particular, buildings can, can become active grid, grid participants. So generating, consuming, storing and selling, buying and selling electricity with the grid. So again, paired together, this results in better management of things like peak loads, which has benefits both at the building level, because again, cost savings during operation, but also emission savings as we're, when we consider tracking emissions from, from individual buildings. It also has uh, broader benefits on the utility because utilities then, uh, rather than having to invest in uh, peak load management or, or um, uh, emissions intensive peak load uh, generation plants, can instead focus on, on um, further accelerations or, or developing further innovations um, and new systems. Now, digital tools have been mentioned a couple of times already, and, and it's really, uh, they play an enabling role uh, for those previous innovations. And we look, took a look at a, a range of digital tools, sensors, uh, smart technologies, and robotics. Each of these have a the, the, uh, significant potential to help cut construction costs, as well as upfront emissions associated with the construction process. And this is largely because they can open up new opportunities for collaboration. Uh, they can al also help speed the process of iter iterative design to, to come up with uh, optimal, uh, optimally performing buildings. Um, and they also play a role in identifying and sourcing materials that have low life cycle emissions. Further benefit is that they can help, uh, these tools can help reduce risk, which is a, a, a component of complex construction processes. And this is because they can enhance information access and communication, and this helps different uh, project partners. So the vendors, builders, and owners uh, communicate with each other and, and, and avoid complications due to, to miscommunication or say missed opportunities of, of, um, or areas of oversight that end, end up resulting in change orders to the construction plans or specifications, which is a, a costly item. Um, digital tools also help in terms of quality assurance. And so the example we use in the, the report uh, is one small one, but we looked at uh, the use of drones for, for doing things like inspecting building em envelopes, particularly in large and tall buildings where it would be difficult to, to have human resources in that, that role. And then one final note about digital tools, and largely this is building information modeling and, and digital procurement platforms. Uh, these can help builders and designers verify product claims or, or material sustainability claims, and then also contribute to the tracking and tracing of those materials. Again, an important part uh, or component of circularity. And of course, uh, as we're collecting data for new construction, this also leads to better forecast uh, product demand which can then help ensure broader access uh, to sustainable materials and products. We can see where they're being used and how. Now, in terms of policy solutions, policy can play a role in, in advancing these innovations in three key ways, and, and Brendan's touched on them a little bit already. Um, so building long-term demand, uh, streamlining processes, and enabling a mission approach. The first, long-term consistent demand, is something that's unlikely to build organically if, if the supply of materials or products and processes isn't accessible or consistently available. It's hard to build on something where, where uh, there's uncertainty of the product being available. Now, building codes are highlighted as, as one way to build this consistency. Uh, building codes can help establish a floor for long-term demand, uh, particularly for low carbon housing. Uh, this in turn fosters the development and use of innovative pro products. And in the case of innovations such as uh, thermal energy networks that require large financial impact inputs, um, government can also play a role in terms of using procurement to then provide certainty needed to follow on investment. So acting really as, as the, the anchor investor in some of those large, large investments. Clarity around code requirements, as well as various approvals needed within the construction process, 
are also needed to streamline streamline that process and eliminate delays. Um, and when we, we when we talk about clarity around uh, codes and standards, that extends to industry standards as well. So having um, a standardized uh, pr approach to digital tools such as uh, BIM or building information mo uh, modeling. And um, finally, rather than continue with one-off relatively shallow policy measures, it would be better if we could implement a coordinated mission approach. And this is something that Brendan and, and Ralph Torrey have pointed out in the past. Um, this mission approach when combined with an end goal can help provide much needed direction which then helps to build long-term demand and streamline processes. Under, under this, the supportive policy environment, we can then much more easily finance and test early stage innovations that help push innovative technologies to the fore and also provide certainty for demand while also removing barriers to innovations that, in reaching full market uptake. This is because the mission approach would then help harness resources and coordinate stakeholders all in the same, under the, in pursuit of the same end state mentioned earlier. This helps encourage collaboration between governments and other actors, um, and all told helps uh, then avoid potential boom bust cycles, which can destabilize a broader market and really have a, uh, an impact in terms of stifling innovation over the long term. So in the report, we used two examples of existing efforts that are underway and that would uh, benefit from greater collaboration, but, but point to the, the complementary nature of, of the approach mentioned in the previous slide. So we have standardization and codes and standards as two areas that can help build demand, albeit in slightly different ways. And so standardization being the push and codes and standards being the pull. So We've seen standardization in the form of housing design catalogs at the provincial and, and federal level underway. And these are really an opportun opportunity to create a policy push. They can, if done right, they can encourage new combinations of technologies, policy, and business models. And they also play a role in disrupting the existing technological system or, or the construction paradigm as it is now. And in doing so, it triggers new, new learning, new ways of doing, doing conducting processes improving those processes and, and refining them to the point that we come closer to our, our end goal. On the poll side, we have codes and standards. And in terms of codes and standards, I think the highlight here is tiered codes. And, and, and this is largely because they establish that end state of uh, net, zero energy, net zero energy ready construction. This creates a market pull around which builders, manufacturers, and suppliers can then orient their, orient their activities and, and prepare their supply chains to meet that Low, low energy, low carbon housing demand. This end state and tiered codes also provide a clear pathway to higher efficiency levels, which then creates uh, greater confidence in the market. Everything from builders having confidence in, in the products that they're using and, and uh, the way they're assembling, assembling them to avoid um, unintended consequences. Uh, and it also offers regulatory certainty. And so investments can be made uh, on the back of that um, that, that clear pathway and that long-term goal. They also help deliver direction and focus uh, to catalyze various technologies, new technologies to also pull them into the market. And these two examples are a good illustration of how different, different levels of government can leverage policy to establish that clear pathway uh, towards better construction techniques uh, by demanding high performance and then working towards that goal by adapting local and national rules to remove barriers to faster, uh, faster construction. Within that, uh, we can then take advantage of, of, of this opportunity to embed energy and environmental performance into, into a more productive con, uh, construction technology system and deliver the, the, the housing units that Canada needs at scale. Uh, with that, I'll say um, thank you for the opportunity to present today and, and uh, I look forward to the questions. All right, great. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, thanks, Kevin. That was an excellent presentation. Lots of material in there. And now we will move on to the question and answer portion of this discovery webinar. So just a reminder, if you have a question, can you please type it into the Q&A box in Zoom? It'll be a little bit easier for us to kind of facilitate and manage them. And, and please do ask your questions. Otherwise, it will be me just lobbing softballs at Brendan and Kevin. So we really want the challenging questions, the hard and tough stuff for them to answer to, to really delve into this issue. 
So while you are all framing your questions, maybe I, I will just ask a general question. And and that's, I, I'm wondering, Brendan and Kevin, if you can speak to this issue of innovation. It always seems to me a little bit tricky. It's like a chicken and an egg thing, you know, that, that you know, it, there's not innovation unless there's demand for it. And, but I, it's not clear to me exactly why it shouldn't just be industry's responsibility to, to innovate. Like, doesn't it kind of, doesn't innovation create its kind of own rewards in a, in a free market? Like if, if there's construction companies that can develop these solutions and bring them to market and build houses cheaper and faster, how come they're not doing it? You want me to answer that? So, I mean, the answer is in a, innovation is systemic. It's, it's not up to one person, which is why you can kind of get stuck and, and you know there's better technologies out there, but they're not, you know, picked up because you need the entire supply chain to, you need the regulatory system, you need all these adaptations to to happen at the at the same time. And it's also like, you know, cost re cost reductions. Things get cheaper the more you do them. So again, like, you know, I think like some of the information I'm aware of on, you know, prefabrication techniques, modular construction techniques is that, you know, I think there's huge potential for cost reductions in the future, the more you have a more industrialized process to building, but the cost reductions might not be seen right now. But what is seen right now is often those higher values in terms of air tightness, higher environmental performance, higher safety performance, which is why I think a lot of technologies that eventually did become cheaper and became cheaper very quickly. You know, they got their foothold in markets by thinking about different forms of value. It's an interesting, like, I think it's a similar story. Great. Thanks, Brendan. Okay. So we've got a question. We've got a bunch of questions now, which is great. I'm just going to kind of work my way through the list. So we've got a question here from Amy. You mentioned the many advantages of prefabrication, Kevin, but are there challenges or downsides to it as well? And I think there's certainly um, downsides. And I, I think, so if we look at things like right now, downsides being an initial investment. So initial investment is uh, very high. And that that points to the need for that demand or that certainty in, in that policy environment that would that would bake in those, first off, those long-term goals of, of being able to meet the housing supply needs, uh, but also then uh, bake in the, the, the energy and emissions performance of those. And, and then we also have challenges in, in delivering those units. And so things like redundant redundant approvals or redundant inspections, challenges in, in delineating where certain responsibilities lie, those challenges demand the, the type of environment that we've envisioned that um, by having uh, the long-term goal of, so we know what we're building, we, we know that it's high performance, the that there will be um, housing needs or housing housing supply, housing demand in, in certain areas and, and really fairly tightly geographic areas. As, as It goes back to the chicken and egg, really. We need the policy in place to be able to uh, overcome those 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 challenges, those remaining challenges in, in prefab. But then we also, we can't get there without, without that policy environment. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. So next question from Deanna. Are there examples of carbon sequestering building materials used in Northern colder climates? And are there any concerns over a period of time? That's a great question. I, I'm not sure I can answer other than to say the materials are, are often um, a like for like. So if, if we're looking at certain materials, say, say wall panels, they're not necessarily specific to a to a, a location or a climate, but it's their use. And how can we expand them and make them accessible in those those northern climates or or in different parts of the country? And so again, we need we need um, products to be accessible and available. Uh, but that really that really only comes if if demand can be certain. And 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 again, we need that policy environment to make the to create that certainty. Okay. Uh, okay, so next question um, from Philip. I see people do use the voting feature. That's great. Uh, okay, can you talk a little bit about how these is these issues impact construction of single unit versus multi unit buildings differently? Interesting. I don't know if they're. 
is a specific difference. So if we if we look at prefabricated units panelization, it's really within that setting the the units the panels can be can can be configured in a multitude of different ways, and the, and the repeatability of design can help with that. And so if we look at the incorporation of something like digital tools, we can we can create repeatable designs that could be used for either. And so take a, a very very simple approach like a shipping container or or that type of unit could be used in either single family or multi-unit multi-unit housing. There's obviously some advantages in terms of scale. And, and, and I think that as we potentially approach the, the end of uh, the single family greenfield, greenfield home, we can, we can focus a lot more effort on multifamily that can then take advantage of, of all the innovations mentioned in terms of prefabrication, new materials used with, with some certainty and some uh, proven applications underway. And then figure out uh, how to neatly tie those into fully electrified projects, and and then tie into thermal networks. And as mentioned uh, during the presentation, those, those are ideal approaches to uh, construction within an urban environment, which is um, uh, much more complex and and also um, has an impact on the livability of the the community. Uh, great, thanks, Kevin. Um, okay, I'm gonna. There's a lot of questions, so I'm gonna try to kind of jump, combine them by themes. Um, okay, so one of them is conventional home building is notoriously weak on the productivity side of things, and I guess the argument that the two of you are making is that the techniques and policies combined that you presented today would would help address that. But curious to know, has there been studies or are there case studies? Or of best practices that demonstrate that, you know, modular or factory built homes would actually lead to like greater productivity. I don't have any offhand. I, I, I sorry. And and part of the uh, I'm hung up on the the question in that we have a productivity challenge, and that's been highlighted by by uh, organizations like McKinsey and more. And that's largely because the process hasn't changed uh, dramatically. Uh, but I would say that uh, modular hasn't really been given a fair chance at, at this point, or it hasn't had the the opportunity to uh, to really shine as it could under the the I guess the paradigm that uh, that we've highlighted in the report. In that, I mean, just in terms of productivity, uh, a factory can be run on three shifts a day, and much easier than than um, construction taking place in 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 the outdoor environment. There's no delays due to things like bad weather. It's much easier to make your way around. You're not not necessarily walking in, say, the mud and, and navigating your way around um, different materials. Instead, it can be much more sequential, much more orderly. And uh, things like the absence of, of say, a, a lead hand or a, a lead carpenter uh, would would have less of an impact. And so that, that role could be stepped in. Also highlighted the use of robotics. And so we have an aging workforce. And there's, there's uh, as we highlight in the early part of the report, there's, there's, I'd say it's fairly serious concerns about that workforce in the next uh, decade or two. Um, and as that workforce ages, we can, we can, we can then see, we're already seeing things like limited use of exoskeleton. So it, similar to what's been, been done in automobile factories for years, helping to move heavy materials around through, through, through things like robotics are sure to, sure to improve productivity. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I'm finding a little bit challenging to listen to the answers, which I want to do, and also read these questions. So give me a second while I catch up. There's a few questions about the connection with affordability. I'm going to try to lump them together a little bit. Okay, so I think part of the argument that you're making is that by, you know, in, through innovation and, 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 and innovation supporting policy, this would help kind of address the affordability concern of, of net zero housing. But like immediately, because isn't isn't the case with innovation that there's kind of like a learning period and maybe things are a little bit more expensive up front and, and maybe, so the question is, can you speak a little bit more to the connections with affordability and what you're proposing? Can I take that one first? Maybe I'll hand it over to Kevin a bit more, but I, it's a great question because that was actually the question we were being asked that made us write this report, right? And so- which was kind of people asking, well, does it cost more? Is it more affordable? Is it less affordable to build to higher environmental performance? Right. And I mean, that's actually unfortunately not in the report, but you know, there's 
the evidence we have out there is that there's there's no relationship really between upfront construction costs and environmental performance. So like BC Housing, for instance, did an interesting analysis of their portfolio and found that, you know, like there's basically zero relationship between, you know, buildings that were at say tier three or even passive house buildings in terms of higher costs up front. So like is building to high performance more expensive, i.e. less affordable? And I'm just talking about the upfront cost. The answer is kind of no, it depends. <laughs> and it depends on a bunch of other things, a whole bunch of other things determine construction costs. So we're kind of confronted with getting that question. And there was really no, you know, no clear answer to that question other than it doesn't need to cost more. So we kind of said, well, we got to ask a different question, right? And the question was, well, what practices are being used to build to net zero or high performance buildings in a way that say meets cost parity or even lower construction costs. And then of course can deliver those very low operational costs in the future, which of course are like durable long-term affordability, right? And and the answer is there is things like good upfront design, you know, having higher performance, fewer materials, reducing a whole bunch of unnecessary costs, reducing the need for say gas hookups or penetrations. You know, the report has a whole bunch of neat examples like thermal energy, removing the need for larger mechanical rooms, right, that can then be used for more housing. So the kind of inspiration behind the report is, is really that what we need to ask is what are the solutions available that can help us be, you know, more productive, right, which means higher value at lower cost right? Because there is no answer to affordability in terms of like, does it cost more to build to high performance? But what we're saying is that if we want to build a lot, if we want to build at lower cost, we're, there's a whole bunch of opportunities in terms of technology innovation to do that. And those opportunities also will help us meet the environmental goals. I don't know if Kevin has anything to add, but that's that's kind of the inspiration behind what we did here. Yeah, that, that's a, a hard answer to, to follow up on. I just obviously through the design phase optimization of, of both the design and the materials and the performance would lead to, to, uh, to savings and, and greater affordability. There's also shorter construction schedules with, with fewer disruptions, which uh, lowers the cost. Uh, one of the, the um, large costs of, of new construction is, is financing uh, on the builders behalf. And this would shorten that schedule and shorten that financing. Um, schedule as well, um, and then w when we when we talk about affordability, we have uh, obviously capital costs, and that's capital costs. The increased capital costs is one of the arguments against uh, energy and emissions performance. And uh, but here we we can also see that through operation, uh, a better performing building would 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 save homeowners money. And then we also have the social costs, and so I guess this looks at electrification, and thermal energy. That as we look to rapidly expand our housing and rapidly expand our, our electricity system, we also need to look for opportunities to to find savings there. And so there is a, a social cost or a social savings that, that can be achieved through this this different construction paradigm that we're we're proposing. All right. Thanks. Thanks to the both of you on that one. I I think we have time for one more question. And I've seen a couple questions in the in the Q and A window about the connection with existing buildings and retrofitting. I'm wondering if if you could speak a little bit to how how if at all this these innovations would be applicable in that in that setting. I'm happy to jump on that. that. And so I, I I invite everybody to to take a look at the report. There is a, a significant section just in, in the interest of time we. We couldn't quite get to that first. So we have a, a, a labor challenge. We, we don't have enough resources to uh, meet new construction demands often, um, but we're also seeing uh, sign significant efforts towards uh, reducing energy and emissions in existing buildings. And to do so, we'll need to retrofit the large, a large component of our, our building stock, our existing building stock. By freeing labor in the new construction through things like pre-assembly or, or through um, digital tools, 
we can then transition that some of that labor over to uh, retrofits, which which will pl- be fairly significant in terms of the the demands on labor resources. And then in terms of I guess lessons or takeaways, obviously each of the each of the the different tools could be used, and so preassembly could be used to speed retrofits or or new additions where applicable. Um, and I think that's an area that really merits further research. Um, Electrification is, is one of the key ways to get to uh, zero emissions in existing buildings. And then we also point in the report to, uh, again, codes and standards as, as being one of those uh, signals that can set long-term demand and, and uh, provide some certainty to the market. And um, we've seen that in the EU with uh, the, uh, I'm sure I'll get it wrong, e- EPBD, but the Existing Buildings Performance Directive. And, and, and likewise in Canada in terms of, uh, and in the U.S. in terms of greater uptake of building performance standards, which, which help define that end state and help us, I guess, galvanize or coalesce technologies, policies around uh, labor resources uh, all around existing buildings. Can I just very quickly follow up on that? I guess what the existing building question, I think, is a great one because just to, I mean, the, the goal is to provide more homes. And that doesn't necessarily mean we need to build new buildings, actually, like a lower cost, easier, lower environmental footprint way to provide no new homes is also to find those homes in existing buildings, right? Which can be things like supporting secondary suites, like through, a, say, a physical uh, retrofit, but, but also just social infrastructure, like co-housing arrangements between say you know seniors and and students so you know um, new homes can be found in existing buildings too i mean some of the questions i'm seeing about like do these kind of more standardized approaches work in like retrofit scenarios and and i think we see cases where things like prefabricated panels can but in more you know there's just because maybe those physical forms of productivity or standardization might not work in server abilities. That doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities to have, you know, things like a better process, right? Or like bucketing homes that need similar upgrade measures into similar buckets, right? Or, you know, having a, having a similar sales process, having a similar, you know, process, even though the, the, the like what you're doing physically might be a little bit different. So I think there's definitely opportunity on the renovation side to do it, you know, more productively, so to speak. Um, but I don't think you would necessarily look at similar solutions as on the the new building side. All right, great. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Brendan. I'm going to wrap up the questions and, uh, there, although recognizing that there was many more that I did not get to, my sincerest apologies to the people that posed them. I'm sure that if you reached out to either of the authors, they'd be happy to answer your questions. Also, I noticed uh, just at the end that there was a, a healthy amount of chat in the other in the chat thing where there's some mention, I think, of resources or of, of companies and locations that are that are kind of advancing these building practices. So quick check that out before I shut it down, if you're interested, uh, where you can also look at the backlog uh, or the back catalog, I guess, of all of the recorded discovery sessions that we've done over several years now. So that's it for today. I'd like to thank both Kevin and Brendan again for their presentation and their you know, dedication to energy efficiency. We really appreciate it. And thank you all to attending this discovery webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.